Baruch Hashem. Okay. Open your Torah with me, please. Let's go to the Torah portion. In my statutes, Behukotai, in my statutes, Leviticus 26. I read this Torah portion and there's so many things in this Torah portion and we don't have time to go into all of it, but by Abba's grace, we're going to get a portion of the portion, right? I pray that you would have all received and I'm trying to watch my time. I want to stay at a certain time. Baruch Hashem. So, Leviticus 26, are we there? Baruch Hashem. I'm trusting in the Most High that each of us would have been able to read the Torah portion and you would have been blessed. The Torah portion would have read you. All right, and that the Torah portion would have gone through you, and you didn't just go through the Torah portion. Okay, so we have this portion here, and it is full of it. So let's let me just read with you, please. Let's read together just the first part. So picking it up from verse three, we want to read this together down to verse thirteen. All right, let's fill this place with the word of the living Elohim. So read with with understanding, and as you read. Read as you read in the oracles of God. So that's exactly what you're reading. This is not just a, a, a word from a geography book. This is god read words. All right? So let's read it with that intensity and that desire and understanding. Not, not haphazardly. So verse 3 together. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandment so as to carry them out, then I shall give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last for you until grape gathering and grape gathering will last until sowing time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live securely in your land. I shall also grant peace in your land so that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land, and no sword will pass through your land. But you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand and your enemies will fall before you by the sword. So I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will confirm my covenant with you. You will eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt, so that you would not be their slaves. And I broke the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. Now let, let's continue from verse 14 and 15. But if you do not obey me and do not carry out all these commandments, if instead you reject my statutes, and if your soul abort my ordinances so as to carry out all my commandments, and so break my covenant, I in turn will do this to you. I will appoint over you sudden terror, consummation, and fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you shall sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies will eat it up. Selah. Okay, so we have read what is called part of the blessing, and you just get a snapshot of the curses. Oh, Father. Curses and blessings. What other chapter in the Torah tells us about blessings and curses, brethren? Anybody? Deuteronomy. So we have Deuteronomy 28 and we have Numbers. So no Numbers. Leviticus 26. Right. And Abba has these blessings and he has what? Curses. 
And when you read these blessings and you say amen to this, and then you read all the curses and you say amen to this, you we really don't want to be breaking those curses, breaking those, uh, those scriptures, right? Because it means that these curses will be coming down upon your head. So when we look at it, the, 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 the blessing is, is there to incite us to, to obedience. And the curses, of course, is there to ensure that they frighten us. Eh? Frighten us enough so that we would not uh, disobey our Father. Now, of course, we should not be serving Him just out of fear. But it does serve as a good motivator. Wait, wait, wait. When you read this thing, you know what other happened to you. All right, so bless the Abbas. Now, let's read this. Go with me, please, to Galatians 3.13. Now read that passage for me, please. Galatians 3.13. Friends, we're going to be going to and fro throughout the book, so I trust that your clicker is working. Galatians 3, verse 13. Is it up there? All right, it says what? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written... Right, so I'm going to ask you, have the curses of the Torah been removed by the death of the Messiah? I want to ask you, L listen to the question. Have the curses of the Torah been removed by the death of the Messiah? What say ye? No, no. Yes. Some say yes, some say no. This is the question. Have the curses of the Torah been removed by the death of the Messiah? Christians commonly teach that Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah. This seems to indicate that the Torah has lost its teeth, so as to speak. In Messiah, the curses are removed, but the blessings remain. Is this really true? No. Ah, Baruch Hashem. What does the text say? Christ says what? Redeem us from the? Singular or plural? Curse is what? Curse is what? Singular. So Christ has redeemed us from the? Curse. Notice my question. What's my question? Have the curses of the Torah been removed by the death of Messiah? No. no. So what has Christ redeemed us from? The curse. So let's look and see. What, pray tell, brethren, is the curse of the Torah? What is the curse of, of, of the Torah? Look at verse 13 again. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of having become a curse for us. For it is written where? In the Torah, curses everyone who hangs on a tree. So what is the ultimate curse of the Torah, brethren? Death. Let's all say that. In case you, didn't, you couldn't answer that, you could answer it now. What is the ultimate curse of the Torah? Death. So what has he re redeemed us from? Death. So the second death has no power over us. But the consequences of sowing and reaping cause and effect still remains. So now that we see that, we should begin to begin to realize, okay, what he has redeemed me from is the condemnation. Because when it says you're under the law, it means you're under the condemnation of death. What is, the wages of sin is what? So what do you get for sinning? Death, right? You, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. And so what Messiah has redeemed us from is death and condemnation. So you know the scripture now in, in Romans. Let's go there. We're going to be coming back to it. Please remember, Christ, Messiah, redeemed us from the curse of the Torah. And the curse of the Torah is death. Ultimate separation from God. That is what he has redeemed us from. Because of sin, we were all condemned to die. So Romans 8.1, let's all read together. Therefore... No. For those who are in, there's no what? So what has Messiah redeemed us from? Condemnation and death. That is what he has redeemed us from. Okay, so there is an unfortunate teaching that says the Torah was nailed to the cross. So let's go across there with me please. Colossians chapter 2. Let's go across there because... It is one of those misunderstood passages, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote things hard to be understand and people who have not studied it, they, they think that Paul was, was anti-Torah. God forbid, never an, anti-Torah. So let's read Colossians 2.14 together and say, Having out the consistent 
was nailed to the cross based on verse 14 a certificate of death I've never seen a picture even though this picture might not have been accurate I've never seen a picture of a Ten Commandments nailed on a cross you ever saw that never saw that I saw every picture that I see I see what looks like a man nailed to the cross not so yes, yes the man was nailed to the cross the man Yeshua Hamishia and he was nailed to that cross because Israel and all the world would have transgress so haven't cancelled out the certificate of death what is the certificate of death many well not many many, yeah, many many teachers unfortunately teach that it is the Torah that was nailed to the cross as if the Torah is against us as if the Torah is hostile to us no brethren what was nailed to the cross was our record of death it's like a it's like they would have nailed to the cross and said, you are put, being put to death because you did this, you did that, you did that. All these things that you did that was against you, that is what it was nailed to, to the cross. Not the Torah itself. Because the Torah is holy, just and good. Amen. I concur with the Torah. Torah is righteous. What was nailed to the cross was our transgression. Have we seen the difference, brethren? What was nailed to the cross was Yeshua dying because we transgressed. So what was nailed to the cross was Yeshua as a sin offering dying because you and I broke the Torah, not the Torah itself. How can you say this was nailed to the cross? Have no other gods before me. Don't love the Lord your God with all your heart. Was that nailed to the cross? No, you have to change that. That was not nailed to the cross. You see, it's a, it's a kind of loophole to, to not do Torah. But this is a misunderstanding. No, brethren, it was Yeshua HaMashiach, the Torah giver who died for your sins and my sins, he was nailed to the cross because he became sin. Because Israel sinned and I sinned and you sinned. That's why he died. So that's why when you look upon the cross, you should see what you and I would have done. And bow our head in shame and humble, say, thank your father. Because what he died for was what you and I did, whether we confess it or not, whether it's private or public, that is what he died for. He died because you and I broke the Torah. That's why he died. So get that straight in your mind when people can't tell you, oh, the Torah was nailed to the cross. Huh? What was nailed to the cross was the Torah giver dying because those he, who he gave the Torah to didn't keep the Torah. And so he came and died for them so that we can now live. It's a whole different ball game, right? So we want to, to, to bring clarity and understanding to that. God forbid that the Torah was nailed to the cross. God forbid. Shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? May it? Never be. So how can I continue in sin and say grace is abundant? May it never be. Right? So we need to correct that 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 the consequences of sin is no longer there. So if you and I let me ask you something. If you say, okay, the law of gravity is no longer in, in effect. Law of gravity, right? You're gonna go outside on the twin towers and jump? Because I believe the law of gravity is no longer I believe it. That was nailed to the cross too. Uh, go on, go on the, the twin towers and jump. You see very well that the law still will break you, right? Baruch Hashem. So we understand that. So you and I can say that the law is broken, but no, brethren, the law is still there. All right? And so what he has redeemed us from is the curse of the Torah. And what is the curse of the Torah? Death. How do we know? Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And our master hung on a tree because he has taken upon himself our curse. Oh my God. He took upon himself our curse. Notice. The curse. And now that we are redeemed from the curse, that we should now live for Him. Because the curses are still there. If we break the Torah, we will suffer the curses. But if we repent, we will not suffer the curse. Are you seeing the difference? Right. And so you and I should be knowing Torah more and more so that we will be sinning less and less. So less and less curses coming upon us. Because we have already been redeemed from the curse. Are you seeing it? We already have life. We are not going to go to the second death. Therefore, I'm going to live the rest of my life to the praise of His glory. Sufficient have I done the will of the Gentiles. But from now on, I suffer in the flesh and I live for Him. That is why I live. Because He has already died for me. So I could live for Him. That is what we are doing, brethren. And so we want to correct this, this misunderstanding that, 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 oh my, oh Father. Ah, back to Leviticus 23. We are teaching, so it was the Messiah, Leviticus 26, it was Messiah who was nailed to the cross, not the Torah. 
problem is not with the Torah. Say the problem is not with the Torah. We're going to see that. And I ask you to go to Leviticus 26. But I make you say something. I want you to say, I want you to see this. But go with me please. Thank you, Rock Hakodesh. Hebrews chapter 8. I had you say that and I know, normally like you to, to see why you say it. Hebrews 8 chapter 7. Thank you, Father. Hebrews 8 chapter 7. Verse 7. Hebrews 8, yes, in chapter 7. Verse 8, verse 7. Good. Are we there? Brookashim. Let's read together. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for the second. Verse 8. For finding Stop, Sela. Finding fault with who? Yeah. Finding fault with who? Yeah. The fault was with the Torah? No, no the fault was with who? Them. You see that when looking right there for finding fault with who? Yeah. Them. So the fault was with the people, not the Torah. Do you see that, brethren? That is so crucial that we get this because the enemy is coming out there and saying the Torah is nailed to the cross. No, for finding fault with the people. So he didn't change the Torah. You know what he did? He changed the people. Oh my God, you should be rejoicing. He changed the people. It's the same Torah, but he changed the people. The people no longer have hearts of stone, they have hearts of flesh. It's the same Torah. Say same Torah. Same Torah. What he has changed is the people. He has not said, okay, what I'm going to do, okay, since it's so difficult for you, what I'm going to do is lower the bar so that you can come up higher. No! He continued to maintain the standard. He said, I should change you and bring you up now. Oh my father. Oh, you can see, I'm giving you the end from the beginning because I'm telling you where, where I'm going by showing you that the fault is with the people for finding fault with them. So by changing them, he, he could now bring them into a better covenant based on better promises. But I'm jumping ahead of myself. We, we can't control and come back there. Leviticus 26. So, as you go back to Leviticus 26, who's the fault with brethren as you go? People, Baruch Hashem. Good. So what we're going to see as we go through here, that this, this uh, teaching here is based on national uh, uh, a national level curse and, and blessing. I want you to consider this. If all Israel breaks the Torah, then the curses of the Torah would come upon Israel. And we have 2,000 years of the Jewish people suffering the effect of the curses of the Torah. Yes? Yes. yes. And what is exciting, because I find within this Torah that looks so gloom and all these curses, my brother, inside there is the seed of hope. Inside. But if he's faithful to the curse, he's faithful to the blessing. Yes. And if he's faithful to bring this curse, then he's faithful to change the hearts of the people and bring the blessing. So I can read Leviticus 26 and people say, whoa boy, what is me? I rejoice because in it I see ah, the hope and restoration buried within the Torah. That's why Yeshua came preaching a message of repentance. You know why? Because he wanted you to repent and come back to the Amen. Baruch Hashem. So, when a person realizes that national blessing is contingent on national obedience, his or her own small life could seem inconsequential. When considering the multitude of the Jewish people that comprise the nation of Israel, a solitary Jewish person might feel discouraged. What can my small contribution make? Even if I live a holy life, will it make any difference? Is it not true that all others are breaking your commandments? If I sin, how will it hurt? Is it true that all of us are sinning daily? I'm saying that to say this. You have national Israel. And one of the Israelites say, well, what I do in private don't matter. Everybody's sinning, so what I do don't matter. No. You and I need to learn a lesson from here. And let's hear this. A person should always suppose that his or her life might tip the balance toward curse or blessing. Each day, a person should regard himself as wielding the power to bring blessing or curse upon the whole people simply through his or her decisions to obey or disobey. Each sin is the rule of all Israel. Each act of obedience brings blessing to all Israel. Are we seeing that, brethren? Amen. You and I are community. As it says, all Israel are companions. All of us are commanded. We are community. And if you think, okay, what I doing in my own little room don't matter, don't affect SMF. Lie! What you do affect all of us. What you do, what I do affect all of us. That's why I need to understand. Listen, 
you understand scale. If I do this, then all FMF going so. That is what I was saying to us. Remember Akan. So please remember your thoughts, words, and deeds. Tip the balance on the next side now, please. To righteousness. Because see it with by your own self. Nobody looking. But look up, right? Here is looking. Alright, he is looking. And he's watching to see how are you going to tip the scale. How are you going to tip the scale? So if it's you alone, you should be righteous before Elohim. That's what he's saying to us, right? Okay, now look at, at, at Le Leviticus 26. I want to, because there's something I want to get to by Abba's grace to, to, to show with us. Good. Now, 26, 3 and 4. Let's read that again. 26, 3 and 4. If you, if, if you walk in my statutes, Okay, stop. Do we have to carry them out? Yes. Do we have to keep it in our hearts? Yes. And do we have to carry them out? Yes. You only carry them out after it is kept. Yes. To keep me, to treasure them in your heart. Yes. So it has to be in your heart. And when you, how should our young man cleanse his way? By taking heed. Your word have I hid in my heart so that I would not sin against you. So if you are not keeping it, then you would not be able to carry it out. But, when I read the scriptures here, 3 and 4, let's read the, the ne next part. Then I will give you rains in their season, so that the land will eat its produce, and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Baruch Hashem. I look at that and I see a foretaste of the messianic era. I look at those passages that I just read in, in, in Le Leviticus 26 and I see a foretaste. And that, that's what I want to speak to us about. A foretaste, a pledge of what is to come. At last Mother's Day, we I alluded to it and we ministered by Abbas Grace on that. But I wanted to take it a bit deeper. That we'll see it, brethren. There's an article A in the back that we gave, a pledge of what is to come. When I look at this, I see a glimpse of the messianic era. I see the powers of the world to come. I see what it will be when all Israel and all nations are obedient to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look what will happen. He said, listen, the land will yield its produce. That's messianic era. The trees and the fruit will bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last for you until grape gathering. And grape gathering will last until so in time. You will thus eat your food to the full and live what? Securely in your life. In other words, nobody breaking in and entering. We are not in the messianic era yet. All right? Look at verse 6. I will also grant peace in your land. What do we pray for in Psalm 122? Shalom. Pray for the shalom of Jerusalem. Right? I will grant peace that is going to come when Messiah comes. So that you may lie down with no one making you tremble. Tell me about the cities of Israel. Where our brothers and sisters are lying down and trembling. Because rockets are coming upon their land. But there is coming a day Amen. when there will be no more rockets. Amen. Baruch Hashem. That, you see it? This is what the M Messiah would have been teaching. He said, I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land. The harmful beasts could, could, could be those deadly animals, snakes, and so, so forth, lions. But it could also represent people. So literal and... Baruch Hashem. He's going to move both of them. All right? Okay. And, and you see, uh, uh, and no sword will pass through your land. What does that mean? No sword will pass through. No more wars, Baruch Hashem. No sword passing through your land. It means no more everybody trying to conquer Jerusalem. No sword will pass through your land. Wouldn't that be a wonderful day, brethren? And then, but you will chase your enemies, and you will, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred. I love that. Five you, five of you, I dare will chase a whole hundred, all right? Uh, uh, and and, and 10,000, and your enemy will fall before you by the sword. Verse 9. So I will turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply you. Are you seeing the language of Genesis? Are you seeing the Edenic covenant and the Adamic covenant and the Noahic covenant? Yes, 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 yes. And then look at verse 9. And I will confirm my... Say, confirm my covenant. Confirm my covenant. That is what makes me excited. Because when I read this, I see, I look at the word um, established and it means kum. And it means raising up a new covenant. So Rashi, interestingly, one of our Jews, it says this. 
I will establish my covenant with you means a new covenant. Unlike the first covenant which you broke at the, at the sin of the golden calf. But a new covenant which will not be annulled. As it says in Jeremiah 33, 31. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So, what am I saying is that the sages are saying that Leviticus 26 refers to a time when God will make a new covenant. They're looking at the covenant God made through Moshe and saying that there is coming a day when God will make a new covenant. Now this is exciting brethren because when we look at it, look at, look at verse 26 again. He said this, verse 9. I will turn toward you and then say, I will confirm my covenant with you. Mean I will establish or I will make it. Verse 10, you will eat what? I've taught you proximity. If a scripture is next to each other, you need to look at what I will say. So what went before is that I will make a new covenant and you will clear out because of the? Oh my God, are you seeing what it is? God is saying, I will raise up a new covenant. You will move on the old way, how you look to do it, and I will give you a new covenant. Are you seeing this, brethren? This is exciting because, oh my father, who was the fault with? Come talk to me. Who was the fault with? The people, not the Torah. Keep saying it again. Guys, get it down in your mind because, listen, James had, uh, he was correcting something. James was writing to the tribes that were scattered abroad. That is Jewish people who are living throughout the diaspora. He was writing to those who are subscribed to Messianic Judaism. He said, listen, when you go out there, the, the influence of Alexander would be so great. And you would have a Greek mindset. So I'm writing to you, I'm warning you, I'm correcting this thing that you have in the church. So he said, faith without works is? Yes. You see, you and I read it not recognizing that when the apostles write, they're writing to correct some problem. Do you understand? When they're writing, they're writing because there's something happening in the church that they need to correct. So what was happening in the church, these people were scattered about under the Greek empire. And they would believe. But he reminded them, faith without works is? I want to change it a little bit. Faith without works is a Greek mindset. Let me say it again. Faith without works is a Greek mindset. Why? Because the Greek mindset will say, confess but not to do. But the Hebraic mindset is faith and Baruch Hashem. Faith and works. Are you seeing it? So the Greek mindset is I believe I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but you're living anyhow. That is faith without works. But when we understand this, we'll, we'll show forth our faith what? By our works. Baruch Hashem. So, the rabbis teach this brethren. The rabbis read this promise as an indication of the divine presence in the messianic era. The Shekinah will rest upon Jews wherever they are. The sages teach that in the kingdom, God's presence will rest directly upon the righteous and within the people. As it says, I will make my dwelling among you, which can read within you. Let me say that again. I will make my dwelling among you. But it also means I will make my dwelling what? So right here in the book of Moses. Please don't miss this brethren. Right here within Moses. The Ruach HaKodesh was saying that God was going to put his spirit where? Baruch. Are you seeing that brethren? I want you to see it and be excited about it. What is Rob so excited about? Because you see I've been reading this story and I tell you again and again. It's like I'm reading it and I'm just seeing a glory coming forth from the Torah. An inner glory that is greater than the glory that I see here. And I want you to see it because like I'm going in the promised land. I'm showing it to you. I have seen the glory. Let us live in this way. Because there is a greater glory. He's called Yeshua HaMashiach. And when you see him, he said, listen, I will put my spirit within you. We're going to get to that scripture. But listen to what he said, just say. The rabbis teach that God will be even closer to the righteous than to the angels. Let me say that again, in case you missed that. Let me say it again. The rabbis teach that God will be even closer to the righteous than to angels. <sighs> Brethren. Are you understanding? God will be closer to you. Why? Because he's going to come and take up his dwelling within you. To which of the angels has he said, oh my God. To which of them has he said, none of them. 
but he has redeemed us and he will be closer to, that's why you will judge angels that's why he said listen why are you having problems within the community don't you know you're gonna judge angels 